uh, Libby Good uh, began loving gardening very early on in her life since she grew up on a family farm which had Hereford cows, fruit and nut trees, bramble berries, and in addition, a large kitchen garden. She joined the Master Gardeners in 2013 and began a uh, five-year term leading our public education effort. And that was during a time of very rapid growth. She continues to teach a variety of classes and enjoys sharing her gardening knowledge and plants with friends and neighbors. She is never without a terrarium and she finds winter gardening particularly rewarding, explains it's such a joy to harvest your own uh, salad beneath a blanket of snow. Thank you, Libby. And Catherine Kellum also grew up in South Carolina with her fingers in the dirt. She became a certified master gardener in 2017. And her greatest pleasure in gardening is being able to eat what she grows and she is nurturing a tiny young food forest in her small urban yard. She is very active in public education, urban agriculture, the help desk, and the Delray Plant Clinic. And in addition, she enjoys providing gardening support to her neighbors in Alexandria. Thank you both. And without further ado, we'll get started. Well, thank you, Colleen. This is Catherine, and Libby and I are so excited to be with you all today and uh, talk with you about how you can save your own seeds from a small urban garden. Now, in terms of our program, we basically divided up the seed saving process. So I'm going to start out sharing a little bit of background information and some reasons why Libby and I think everybody should be saving seeds from their own garden. I'll also help you understand how you can ensure that you get good quality seeds to save. And that comes down to two main things, choosing plants wisely and then managing the pollination process. Now we'll pause at that point for questions and then I'll hand it off to Libby. She'll cover harvesting and cleaning your seeds. She'll share some basic rules and she'll explain both ways that seeds may be processed, the dry processing method and the wet processing method. She'll also give you great information on how to store your seeds and tell you what you should be able to expect in terms of seed longevity. And then we'll wrap up with any final questions. Now, what do we mean when we say seed? Well, I think we all know a seed when we see it, but this is my favorite definition. It's a baby plant in a box with its lunch. And I love this because it reminds us that while they don't look like it, seeds are actually living things and they have lifespans. So as savers of seeds, we want to choose the best quality seeds and we want to care for them to ensure that they have a long and healthy lifespan. Now, this brings me to my favorite seed saving story, which I'm also gonna share with you. In the early 1920s, so about 100 years ago, there was a man named Art Cohn who was exploring in a very remote kind of wild area in Arizona where he found a sandstone cave. And in the back of the cave on a natural shelf was a small container. It's thought now that that container had been there for hundreds of years. It was a mess. He took it home. He cleaned it up. And when he opened it, it was full of bright red watermelon seeds, like the seeds you can see in the picture here. He counted out 200 seeds that were in that container. Now, a typical relic hunter would have just thrown away the seeds and kept that container. But Art Cohn loved seeds and he loved growing things. And he planted all 200 of those watermelon seeds. And amazingly, six of them actually germinated and produced strong, healthy plants. The watermelons they produced were extremely unusual, not like the melons you see in the picture here. We'll come to that in a minute. The watermelons that grew from those seeds were very small, very dark green. They had long, crooked necks, and the flesh was really, really sweet. They were like little, tiny, sweet watermelons with handles on them. 
He loved a lot of qualities. The plants were very heat tolerant, very drought tolerant, the flesh was very sweet. The problem for Art was if he was going to grow those watermelons, he needed to be able to sell them. And his customers weren't looking for tiny watermelons with handles. They were looking for full-size watermelons. So what Art did was he saved the seeds, only the seeds, from the largest, roundest fruits. And every year he planted those seeds, he saved again, he planted the next generation, and he eventually produced large, more conventional looking watermelons, like the big one you see in the picture here. Now, you can buy those seeds today and you can grow those bigger watermelons. But as you can also see in the picture, every once in a while, a smaller melon pops up and it has a little bit of a crook neck. And so today, a hundred years later, what's interesting to me is there are still farmers in that area who are growing those melons, but some of them are, let's call it reverse engineering. They are selecting the smaller melons, the more dark green with the more pronounced crook necks. Their goal is to bring back the original watermelons that the Native Americans valued. And I love this story because it illustrates a number of the different reasons that Libby and I think are so important for people to save their own seeds. First, by saving your own seeds, you have the foods and other plants you want immediately available and accessible to you with the features and the qualities that you want and adapted to your location. As an added bonus, there's very little cost to it. It's basically free and seeds tend to be really generous. When we save seeds, we almost always have many more than we're actually going to use ourselves. So let's dig into those reasons just a little bit more. Now, in terms of the availability and accessibility of the foods and the other plants that we want, the best example that I can think of of this is heirloom plants heirloom vegetables, fruits, herbs, whatever plants are important to you, people through the millennia have saved seeds of the plants they valued. And there are just a few examples of heirloom plants here. But the neat thing about this is that as people around the world saved seeds, they also shaped those plants and the things they harvested from those plants to give them more of what they valued. And the way that happens, well, let's use Art Cone as an example for saving seeds to shape features. He saved seeds every year and always planted out his most recent seeds. So he was able to shift the appearance and the size of the watermelons. And that meant what his customers wanted, which meant he could sell those melons. But why didn't the original Native Americans save seeds to produce bigger and bigger melons? They obviously could have done that, but they chose differently. So they had different goals. Now, if you think about what those goals might have been, there are a couple of things I can think of. One is those little watermelons were lightweight and portable. They were basically a source of water and nutrients and you could take it with you very easily. In fact, with that crook net, it was hands-free because you could just hook it on something and take it with you. Another reason they might have wanted the smaller melons is because with a big melon, you can share it, but you all have to be there at the same time to enjoy it. With the little ones, basically everyone can have their own melon and they can enjoy it when it makes sense for them. And if you've got really big fruits, you're not going to have many of them for vine, but a vine can produce a lot of smaller fruits. So that's the difference in goals and values. And as we're going through the class today, talking about how to save seeds, one of the things that you should be doing is thinking about the plants you want to save seeds from, and then what are the qualities and features that you want more of in future crops? So are there particular flavors? Do you love sweet? Do you love more savory? Do you love more complex flavors? Are there particular shapes? Like do you want a little watermelon that has a handle on it? Uh, size, do you want bigger plants or maybe do you want smaller plants? Uh, bigger fruits or smaller fruits? Are there particular colors that you would like more of? Maybe particular colors of flowers in your garden? 
So think about that. Now, the other really interesting thing to me is that we are saving seeds and shaping plants for the future. The plants are also shaping themselves to better adapt to our location. So when you save seeds and then plant them out the next year and then save again and plant out the next year the way Art did, your plants are adapting to your location, your climate, your soil, even your gardening practices. So I think that is an amazing reason that we should all be saving seeds from our garden. And then last but not least, seed saving is virtually free. There's very little actual expense in it. It's mostly the time of the gardener and the space that we allocate to those plants in our garden. And as I mentioned earlier, seeds are very generous. When we save seeds, we almost always have way more seeds than we're really going to grow out ourselves, which means we can share them with friends, with neighbors, with family. We could even participate in local seed exchanges if we wanted to. And if you're a particularly crafty person, you might want to do things like creating your own seed mixes, like wildflower mixes, or maybe you want to create gifts. In the top right photo on the slide, you'll see an example of seed paper. Now, there are instructions all over the internet about how to make your own seed paper, so we're not going to go into that in this class. But the fact is, that's a great way to use a lot of extra seeds. And it's a great way to get kids involved in a different fashion in terms of gardening. They can use those extra seeds to make and create ornaments and then later go plant them. So that's a lot of fun. Now, that's a lot of benefits from saving seeds, but I know a lot of people who are extremely wary about saving seeds, and I understand the reasons why. If you've been gardening for a while, or even if you just have a compost pile, you're familiar with volunteer plants popping up in your gardens, and they're not always the most desirable forms of the plants that pop up. We have a great example of that here on this slide. This was shared by a fellow master gardener, Beth Buffington, and it's a great example of basically seeds gone wrong. Uh, so Beth, Beth started out with a number of beautiful ornamental pumpkins. They were left over from an office party. Nobody else wanted them, so Beth brought them home to start a compost pile. She put them in a very out of the way place in her yard where she wanted to start the compost pile and she forgot about them. The next summer, she turned that corner for the first time in a very long time and she had a pumpkin farm, an accidental pumpkin farm. But those beautiful ornamental pumpkins that she had brought home had produced pumpkins that were not beautiful ornamental at all. They were all these various shades of orange. Uh, a couple of them had some deeper ribs. One of them was climbing the fence, so that was kind of fun. The only really interesting thing was odd. One of them was actually an acorn squash. And by the way, that can really happen. And I'll talk about that in a little while. But the important lesson here is that whether it's volunteers popping up or our poor seed saving, we have to remember that things can go wrong because seeds always reflect their parentage. And that's what we need to keep in mind. And that's really what the rest of my part of today's presentation is about, is how to ensure good parentage of your seeds. So this brings us to a question that Libby and I, and probably all master gardeners, are always being asked, which is, can all seeds be saved? Can I save seeds from this thing growing in my garden, from something I brought home from the farmer's market or a tomato from the grocery store? The better question to ask is, should all seeds be saved? Because if we don't want results like that accidental pumpkin farm, then we need to be discriminating. And there are three things that we need to know. We need to know the source plant, the plant we think we want to save seeds from. Is it open pollinated or is it a hybrid? We need to understand its flower structure. Does it have perfect or imperfect flowers? And how does that plant need to get pollinated? Is it self-pollinated or does it require cross-pollination from another plant of the same variety? Now we're going to dig into all three of these. So first things first, is the plant we're thinking of saving seeds from an open pollinated plant or a hybrid? 
Open pollinated plants are wonderful plants to save seeds from. Their flowers fertilize naturally. They, they either self-fertilize or pollinators like bees and moths get involved or they're wind pollinated where the wind blows in the pollen. But they fertilize naturally. And when they are fertilized by another plant or themselves, another plant of the same variety or themselves, then they produce seed that produces the next generation of plants just like them. So you get very predictable results and a great example is those heirloom plants I was talking about earlier. They have been saved over generations. They pollinate naturally, whether it's pollinators or wind or self-pollination, and they're very predictable. They're reliable. Now, let's contrast that with hybrid plants. Hybrids or F1, F1 is just a code for hybrid. Hybrid plants are a gamble for saving seeds. And that's because they are a cross between two different varieties. This gets to the parentage. So when you buy a plant from a garden center or you buy seeds and they're labeled hybrid, the companies that produce them purposefully crossed two different varieties. And they did that because they know when they do that, they get a very desirable result. It might be a more delicious flavor, it might be better disease resistance. Maybe it's a compact size that's great for containers, but they get a very predictable, desirable result. The problem is that that result is only good for one generation. When you save seeds from that hybrid, you don't know, and, and you plant them again, you don't know what you're going to get because you don't know the parentage. You don't know, you only know there was a cross of two different varieties. So if you save those seeds and try to grow them out, first of all, they may not even germinate. They're not going to be true to the plant that you saved them from, and you don't know the parentage. So at least some of those desirable characteristics, that delicious flavor, that disease resistance, whatever it is, some of that is bound to be lost. So let me just go back and emphasize. The difference between open pollinated and hybrid is one thing to understand, but the thing Libby and I really want you to take away from this, particularly if you're a beginning seed saver, is stick with open pollinated vegetables, herbs, et cetera. You're just gonna have more reliable results. You're less likely to get results like that accidental pumpkin farm. Now, we also need to understand the flower structure of a plant and how it wants to be pollinated. We're gonna start with flower structure. And what you see in the diagram here, very basic diagram of a perfect flower. A perfect flower is simply a flower that contains both the male and female parts. In other words, everything that's needed for pollination to happen versus imperfect flowers, which are separate male and female flowers. And we will look at examples of that in a little bit. But right now, I just want to focus on the perfect flower and its structure and why that's important. You see, I put a couple of yellow and red labels there. The female portion of the flower is that center portion. It's shown in light green, and it's got that sort of frilly top on it. That's the stigma. That's the part that receives the pollen. Now, all around the female part of the flower are the male parts. And up at the very top of the male parts, that's called the anther. And that's where the pollen resides. And that pollen is shown in this diagram as red. So you can see from looking at it, the pollen and the stigma in very close proximity. And in a perfect flower that will self-pollinate, that makes pollination very easy. In the best possible scenario, with perfect flowers, we get flowers that naturally self-pollinate. They don't need another flower to be involved. These are the absolute best plants for gardeners to save seeds from, and especially for beginning seed savers. Perfect flowers, and they have a closed environment. Now, let me explain what that means. If you look at the picture here, this is a picture of a tomato blossom from my garden. And if you look at the center part of that 
blossom, what you see is actually the male portions of the flower wrapped around the female portion very tightly. It's a closed environment. And that pollen up at the top is right against the stigma, which receives the pollen. So most tomatoes are self-pollinated before the flower even opens. They are constructed to self-pollinate. And then if there's any little bit of movement, even just gentle breeze, just a little bit of wind, that helps that connection between the pollen and the stigma take place. It is possible with naturally self-pollinating flowers that sometimes an insect can get involved and move pollen around, but that is so rare. And if you're saving seeds from your garden, it is really not worth worrying about. Now, the nice thing, for seed saving is that tomatoes are not the only crop that we grow that are natural self-pollinators. There are actually five additional crops that most of us probably grow at least some of the time in our gardens. Peppers and eggplants, which are in the same family as tomatoes, and then peas and beans, they are also natural self-pollinators, and lettuces. So you really have crops for every season uh, that will naturally self-pollinate. And that means all you need to do is wait and harvest those seeds. And Libby will talk about harvesting and processing seeds in a little while. Now, what about when a plant does not naturally self-pollinate? It might still have perfect flowers, but it doesn't have that closed environment or it has imperfect flowers. Well, that's referred to as assisted pollination because some assistance is required and either pollinators get involved or the wind uh, gets involved and moves the pollen around. So with pollinators, it could be moving the pollen around the same plant or a different plant as long as it's the same variety. And with the wind, it's definitely going to be from a different plant. But here's the thing when something like a pollinator or the wind is involved. If we, the gardener, want to ensure the parentage because we want to save those seeds, then we have to get involved. We have to manage or control that pollination process. And there are four techniques. I'm going to run through them very quickly here. And then we're going to look at some additional crops that we typically grow in our gardens and how we can use these techniques to control pollination with those crops. So just walking through them very quickly, uh, the first technique is called isolation. And basically we either isolate individual flowers or we isolate entire plants. And, and that's referred to sometimes as bagging or caging, uh, but we isolate and then we hand pollinate and that's how we control it. With some plants, all we need to control is that we just grow one variety and we let the insects do their job. Uh, occasionally, we might have an opportunity where we could grow two different varieties and save seeds from them if their flowering period doesn't overlap. So you grow variety A and you let it flower and produce seed, and then later you grow variety B and you let it flower and produce seed. But the flowering periods don't overlap, so the insects can't move the pollen back and forth between the two different varieties. There's not a lot of opportunity for me to do this in my garden, uh, but one opportunity is when, with some of the cool season crops. So uh, if it's a crop that will grow both in the spring and in the fall, I could grow one variety in the spring and another variety in the fall and save seeds for both of them. And we'll, we'll look at an example of that in a little bit. The last technique that's used to control pollination is physical distance having two varieties growing so far apart that the insects aren't going to fly from one to the other uh, or the wind's not going to blow the pollen from one to the other. And that usually involves much bigger distances than we have in our small urban gardens. Uh, but we will talk about that a little bit later on. So let's look at some examples and how we use those techniques to control pollination. Our first example here is with members of the cucurbit family. So this is cucumbers, squash, melons, pumpkins, gourds. All of these plants are insect pollinated and they have imperfect flowers, separate male and female flowers. Now, those of you who've been growing cucurbits, you're probably familiar with that structure. But for those of you who aren't, 
Libby has taken some wonderful photos here to help illustrate some of this process. And if you look at the green photo, the one in the upper left, that shows you male and female squash buds. The flowers aren't open yet, they're not blossoms, but you can see the buds. And underneath that male squash, um, squash bud, you see a long, thin stem. That's how you know it's going to be a male flower. Underneath the female bud, you see this wide, curvy stem. It looks like a little squash. That's how you know it's going to be a female flower. And so what you do as the gardener to control pollination and keep the bees from getting involved is you start the day before because buds open up into flowers extremely early in the morning. And the bees get going on those flowers extremely early in the morning. So what you wanna do the day before is you wanna bag, you wanna isolate a male squash bud and a female squash bud so that when it opens the next morning, the bees can't get at it. You wanna securely bag it. And then the next morning, when you get out there, you unbag the male blossom. It will be an open blossom now. Unbag it and pick it and pull all of the petals off of it. And then you unbag the female blossom and you use the male blossom to just dab into the center of the female blossom and transfer that pollen. And if you look at the photo in the upper right hand corner, you see a picture of Libby doing exactly that. She's transferring the blossom from the male flower into the female flower. And what she does immediately after that, if you look down below in the bottom right, is she closes up, she seals up that female blossom so the bees can't come in behind her and pollinate with something else that would cross with that. So all that's left to do after that is really, you probably want to protect it. You definitely want to mark it. You want to remember which squash you hand pollinated because that's the one you want to save seeds from, but also you want to keep any varmints from getting at it, things that might want to chew on it. You want it to grow up and mature and be good and healthy. So you might want to bag or put some sort of structuring around it to just protect it from critters uh, in the vicinity. And then Libby will talk about how you harvest and process the seeds. So that's cucurbits. Now, Remember early on when I talked about the accidental pumpkin, pumpkin farm producing an acorn squash? Well, you'll notice that squash and pumpkins are all cucurbits. And there is a handout in your materials that shows cross-pollination risks. And part of that handout deals with the cucurbits. And if you look um, uh, at how that's structured, on the left side, we list seven species of cucurbits and next to them, to the right of them, for each of those species, all the different varieties that fall in there. All those different varieties will cross with each other. So if you look at that very first one, cucurbita pipo, and you read across to the right, many summer and winter squashes, you see acorn listed, you go further down, you'll notice ornamental gourds and field pumpkins. That kind of crossing is how a pumpkin can produce a seed that produces an acorn squash. And that's why we want to control the parentage when we're saving seeds. So I'm not gonna spend more time on this, but that's a really valuable resource for you to take following the class. Now let's look at some more things growing in your garden that you might wanna save seeds from. A couple of annual greens, dill and arugula, uh, they're both insect pollinated. They're cool weather crops, so you plant them early in the season. When it starts getting warm, they'll bolt, which just means they go to flower. They put up the shoot and the flowers are produced and the bees pollinate them. And so all that's needed here to get good seed is just grow one variety, grow multiple plants, of dill, but just one variety, open pollinated, grow multiple plants of arugula, an open pollinated variety, let the bees do all the work, and you just collect the seeds and save them. That is so easy peasy. In contrast to another annual grain a lot of us like to grow, which is spinach. Spinach is a wind pollinated plant, and um, it's, it's tricky in another manner as well. It, uh, it doesn't just have separate male and female flowers, it has separate male and female plants. 
And as gardeners, we don't know which of our spinach plants are male and which are female until they actually put up the flower shoots and form flowers. And that's when we can tell them apart. Now, because insects aren't involved, it's not enough to just grow one variety and let the insects have at it. The wind actually needs to move that pollen from the male to the female plant. The problem with wind is that it can carry pollen a long way. And so if someone else could be growing a different spinach variety um, in, you know, in your neighborhood, maybe a few blocks away, and your plants get pollinated with that. The way to control that parentage is to grow multiple plants that you can bag together. So it's a bigger bagging, a bigger isolation process, and use a windproof bag so the pollen can't get through it. And then you jiggle the bag around a little bit to stir up the pollen so that your female plants, your female flowers get pollinated. I will tell you, I love spinach. Um, I'm never going to do that. If you don't care about cross-pollination, potentially from another source, maybe like me, you would think, okay, my neighbors, when their spinach bolts and goes to flower, they're going to yank it out. They're, they're probably not saving it for seeds. So uh, I would just take my chances with the wind. But with that, you don't really know what you're going to get. And then one more group of crops that uh, I want to talk about, and this is of uh, three different families of crops, but I brought them all together here because of their similarities. They're all biennial crops, which means they're not going to flower and produce seed in one season. You're going to have to leave them in the ground, not pull them out in the fall and winter. You're going to have to leave them in the ground, let them winter over, and then the next spring they'll put up their flower stalk and let the bees have that flowers and produce seed. So it's not hard as long as you're willing to devote the garden space to it. But here's the thing, you can only grow one variety and understanding what that variety is, is important. Just like with the cucurbit, sometimes plants that we think are different vegetables or different fruits are actually just different varieties of the same species. An example here with the brassica family, all of these vegetables you see listed here, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, et cetera, they are all biennials and they are all varieties of the same species. Your cauliflower will cross with your radishes, your cabbage will cross with your broccoli, like any of them will cross with any other because as far as the plants are concerned, they're the same species and it's not a problem. So as a gardener, if you're growing multiple brassicas and you want to save seeds, just let one of them winter over, let the insects have at it, and then collect the seeds. And that way you won't get any weird crossing. Now, the same thing applies to the two crops that are listed there in the beetroot family. Both of these are biennials, beets and chard, and they will cross with each other. So again, you can grow both, but maybe just let one winter over and you let the insects do their job and you collect the seeds. And then in the carrot family, it's not quite exactly the same thing with carrots. Carrots don't cross with parsley or parsnips, the other things that are listed there, but they do cross with wild carrots. And wild carrots are also known as Queen Anne's lace. It's a weed slash wildflower. And it's a very common weed. So if that's growing in your area, it could actually cross with your domestic carrots. Two other uh, crops that cross are celery and celery root. They are varieties of the same species. They're not really commonly grown here, I don't think. Um, so it's probably not a big deal, but again, you don't have to worry about your carrots crossing with your parsley, for instance, uh, but you do need to worry about Queen Anne's lace. And then just to uh, reinforce and expand on a couple of things I talked about earlier before we break for questions, always, always, always save seeds from your absolute best plants. They should be open pollinated. They should be your healthiest and most vigorous plants. They should be producing your best tasting crop. Whatever taste means to you, it should be the best. Beyond those three things, also consider other factors like productivity. Productivity could be the number of fruits produced, it could be the size of the fruit. 
early maturing. If, if you're seeing a plant that's producing crops earlier, that means you get a longer harvest season, that's great. Or if it's a plant that bolts like arugula and you've got plants that are later to bolt, that means you have a longer harvest season. That's something to consider for saving seeds. If you have any plants that show signs of disease resistance or insect resistance, I would definitely save seeds from those. And stockiness, this is something we don't always think about in plants, but stocky plants support their fruits better, which helps to have healthier fruits. So that is actually a wonderful feature to save seeds for. And then lastly, particular colors or particular shapes. You know, I go back to that little watermelon with a handle on it for the shape. Uh, but color, Libby, uh, Libby shared with me that she is growing both red and orange tomatoes this year. And she doesn't have as much trouble with the birds getting at the orange tomatoes as with the red ones. So she's definitely saving seeds from those and she's sharing those with me too. So that's fun. And that is a great thing to know. All right, I'm going to talk about harvesting and cleaning seeds. Uh, Catherine, thanks for all the great information. I think you gave everybody a good grounding in why to save seeds, how seeds form, and what to look for. And I'm going to talk about a more hands-on approach of how to process seeds. And we have two different general categories of processing seeds. One is dry processing, one is wet processing. And then I'm going to talk about how to store seeds for longevity. Uh, you want to make sure that those little seeds, which are things that are alive, are saved carefully so that they will serve you well into the future. First, I want to go over some basic rules for saving seeds. Catherine, you said early on that we all know what a seed looks like. Well, I would kind of challenge you on that because we may not know what all seeds look like, and I will share a case and point on that in a little bit, but make sure you do your research and know what you're looking for. Know what your target seeds do look like. Save seeds from your healthiest, most robust, tastiest crops. Whatever traits are important to you, those are the ones that you want to save seeds for. I would add two points of caution here. Save seeds from healthy crops, healthy produce. If you're plant has a blemish in it, that could serve as an entry point for pathogens. Any crack might be an entry point. And some of those pathogens can pa be passed on to the next generation through the seed. So look for produce that are blemish free. And secondly, generally bigger is better. You want to save things from the biggest, largest, healthiest crops and the seeds that are bigger are better. They're most likely to produce healthier seedlings, uh, with stronger root systems that can better absorb nutrients from the soil. Another point is to harvest seeds from fruits that are mature. In some cases, that may mean you need to harvest seeds from fruit that is overly ripe. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, more later. Process properly to improve the germination rate and longevity. And this is really important. Test your seeds to make sure they're thoroughly dry before you store them. And then finally, you wanna make sure you label your seeds every, in every step. So many seeds look alike. And if you don't label them, you may end up having a kale seed that is really a basil seed or some other thing. So make sure you keep track of the seeds you're saving to avoid confusion down the road. Seeds are processed either in a dry process when you have seeds that are held in flower heads or pods or in a wet process where seeds are actually in fruits. And dry process are things like beans and peas and lettuce uh, or a wet process or when seeds are inside a fruit, cucumbers, pumpkins and squash. A lot of the vegetables we think of are actually fruits where the seeds are internal to them. It's a multi-step process. In the dry process, you have a, a threshing process where you separate the seed pod or whatever kind of case it is. And the seeds are held in a variety of different kinds of capsules, pods, seed heads but you separate that from the plant in a threshing process. And then a second step is a, what's called a winnowing process where you actually separate the seed from whatever pod or seed case the actual seed is held in. 
Same thing with the wet process. It's a multi-step process where you separate the uh, seed material along with some of the flesh from the fruit. And then you, a second step is separating the actual seed from whatever gel coating it's encased in. Let's talk first about seeds and flower heads. These are pretty simple and they're Examples are some of the greens like lettuce, kale, and spinach, and a lot of biennials. In this case, the seeds are held in a stalk above the plant, and you want to cut these stalks off before all the seeds are dry. Why is that? Well, because if you don't, a lot of the seeds will get lost if you wait until the stalk is fully dry. You cut off the stalk, and you dry the whole stalk. I like to put it in a paper bag. You can put it on a cookie sheet or something of that sort. And if you just store it upside down in a paper bag in a uh, few days, the seeds will fall off. You can shake the bag, bang it against the counter, um, and then store the seeds in a cool, dry place. It's really easy for these because they fall off very readily. And then you just take the stalk out and pour the seeds into a, a container or a seed saving packet when they're fully dry. I've got a set of ornamental flower seeds here as another example of seeds that are generally held in some kind of flower head. In this case, you wanna make sure, you, of course, you choose your best plants, whether it's based on the color or uh, some other characteristic that you value. In this, these set of examples, I have milkweed, cone flower, and cardinal flower. Again, you don't wanna deadhead these. You want to let the flowers stay on the uh, plant until the petals fall off. Uh, in many cases, the flower will uh, turn brown. You want the stem to turn brown, and then you will cut it off well below where the stem has browned. Again, you can put them in a paper bag. A good hint here, though, is to collect them on a dry day. That will give you a step ahead in the drying process. You don't want to collect them after it's rained because they may end up molding before they have a chance to dry. So collect on a dry day and again, dry them in a paper bag. Eventually, the seeds will fall off when they dry. It can take anywhere from a week to up to a month for these seeds to dry and fall off. And this is another example of a dry process. A couple of examples here I wanna share with you where you need to be a little bit more careful. I mentioned about not understanding what seeds look like. Let's take the example of cardinal flower. I bought some cardinal flower plants a few years ago. I love them because they give you such a bright pop of color in my garden. They grow well in shady spots. And particularly I love them because they are such a hummingbird magnet. And I love to watch the hummingbirds flit around and there, there's, there's so many of them right now as they begin to migrate south. And I wanted more of them. So I was saving the seed pods for cardinal flowers and I went out for several years and I could feel the little pods and I noticed, gosh, they just felt empty. There was nothing in them. So I just discarded the uh, seed pods, put in my compost pile and uh, you know, very few uh, new cardinal flowers until after a couple of years, I learned that I didn't know what they looked like. I didn't know what the seeds looked like. I learned that you have to crush the dried seed pods after they're thoroughly dry and you put them in a sifter and you sift out the tiny dust-like seeds. And you'll see here, these are what the seeds look like. They are you know, practically bigger than the size of the spores you get from ferns. So do yourself a favor. And if you're not sure what the seeds look like, do a little research and find out what to expect, what to look for. So you'll know when you're processing the seeds, what it is you're gonna get. Uh, echinacea is another example of seeds where you need to take a little bit of care. They have these really spiky, very, very sharp little spines on them. I think that they're there to help aid in dispersion. But use gloves when you're removing these spikes. What you want to do is rub off these spikes and, that are attached to the seeds wearing a pair of thick gloves and the spikes will be attached to the seeds. You rub those off of the seeds and the seeds themselves are what I call these little shark tooth looking um, parts of the plant and separate 
the good, healthy, plump ones from some of the ones that are a little small and misshapen. These are the ones that, again, will give you the healthier, bigger seedlings. So save those. There's some other seeds that might need some extra protection while they're maturing. I mentioned echinacea. You're trying to circumvent mother nature when you're out there trying to save seeds. Things like uh, wildlife, wind, and storms can hamper your efforts. In the case of uh, echinacea, for example, goldfinch, love them. I love to watch the goldfinch. I love to share seeds with goldfinch, but I like to save some for myself. So cover some of the uh, plants with a gauze bag or some other device to save some for yourself and leave some for the wildlife. There are other plants like impatiens. Impatiens are such fun. They have these little football shaped seed capsules that explode when you brush by them. My kids used to love to gather handfuls of the seeds and bring them to the house and they would explode the seeds all over the kitchen. And it really was fun to do. If you've never seen this, if you've never done it yourself, go out and find some impatient seeds pods and, and let them explode. They just pop open and uh, you may have impatience growing where you didn't expect them, but it, it really is great fun. Uh, one of the things I had in my garden a lot of is columbine. Uh, it's a lovely native plant in our area. And if you brush by the seed pods, they can spread far and wide. That's great up to a point. I've gotten to the point where they have spread so and far and wide that they have become overly aggressive. And I need to either deadhead them or cover the ones I want to save and get rid of the ones I don't. So you can have some protection for uh, to avoid unwanted uh, aggression in the garden too. Another plant I have is a peony and I've been dying to get some good seeds for this one because it's such a beautiful plant. And I put a gauze bag over the seed pot here. And I have also learned that I need to put more than one gauze bag over more than one seed pod because I came back from vacation and found that someone, something had pecked or torn open my gauze bag. So plan for mishaps, plan for sharing with wildlife, give some extra protection to some of the seed pods out there that you think are special and you really wanna make sure you have. I now wanna talk about some of the seeds that come in pods. Beans and peas are really simple. Everybody knows what a bean looks like, what a pea looks like. Those are the seeds of those plants. For these, you just let the seed pods dry on a vine. And when they turn color, it can be dark brown, it can be light brown, it can be black for some varieties. When it turns brown and crispy, they're ready to harvest. You can actually hear the seeds rattling around inside. Bring them inside. They may need to dry a little bit longer indoors for maybe a week or so. But then when they're dry, you can just rub them together and the seeds will fall out. Test them for dryness. Take a hammer, smack the bean or the pea. If it cracks open, it's dry. If it smushes, it's not. Let it dry longer, and then you can just store those in a paper bag. You wanna check them for any signs of um, insects or disease damage to make sure you're saving good, healthy seeds, and then store them in a cool and dry location. So that's another example of dry processing. Peppers are kind of an in-between. They're a fruit, the seeds are held inside the, the actual uh, uh, produce, uh, but they are processed in a dry manner. You wanna leave peppers on the plant until they change color. Generally it's a red color or a deep red color. And it's best to leave them on the plant until they get, get kind of wrinkly on the outside. And then they're really easy. You just slit them open, you scrape out the seeds. You can dry these on a piece of paper. They generally are not very, won't stick to anything. And just let them dry for a, a week or two. Again, check for dryness So, If you can dent them with the, your fingernail, they're not dry, let them dry longer. Now let's talk about wet processing. These are seeds in fleshy fruits. And I want to talk about when you harvest them. For tomatoes and watermelon, generally 
you can harvest the seeds when the fruit is fully ripe. For squash and cucumbers and eggplant, you wanna harvest the seeds when the fruit is well past the edible stage. And this you generally wanna to do towards the end of the season. Um, you need to leave these fruits on the vine or on the plant past the point where you'd want to harvest them to eat. And that generally reduces the vigor of the plant. Plants live to produce seeds. And if you leave these fruit on the plant early in the season, the plant is gonna lose vigor. It's gonna be less productive and you'll have less of your vegetables during the course of the season. So harvest these towards the end of the season. Season. Let them stay on the plant until you know, the melon may get hard, the cucumber may turn yellow, and just let them, let them stay there for a while. And some of them may even need some additional curing inside. So that's the, the harvest time for these. Now let's talk about the process. And some of them benefit from a fermentation period. Tomatoes, for example, you want to scrape the seeds and the pulp into a glass, cover it with a generous amount of water, set it aside for a few days. You can stir it around you know, a couple of times a day perhaps, and it'll begin to ferment. That fermentation removes some of the factors that inhibit uh, germination. It'll begin to mold the pulp and some of the seeds that are less than fully viable will float to the top. And after a few days, you can pour off that top layer. The seeds that are healthy are the ones that are heavier. They're the ones that are most likely to have been germinated. They've got a little baby plant lurking within and they are the ones that will sink to the bottom. So pour off the floaters and the stuff on top and then save the what's on the bottom, rinse it off very, very thoroughly and put it in a strainer and let it dry. Spread them out in a single layer, and you want to dry them for about three weeks and store it in a cool, dry place. And I will say for melons, some of the melon seeds you can get from a ready to eat melon, but you're going to get more higher quality seeds if you let those melons get beyond the ripe stage. And that means when it starts to get soft and a little bit mushy. So you get better quality seeds if you wait longer. Squash and pumpkin, a lot of those, in fact, all of those you need to wait to harvest when the, when the uh, crop is very hard on the outside. And then you want to cure it inside beyond that point too. This picture on the left is of a delicata squash that I grew. It had sat on my kitchen counter. I collected the seed. I say when it's ready to cook, but this one was actually beyond that. I was lucky I didn't have seeds sprouting inside the plant. Sometimes you, that actually does happen. You want to scoop out the seeds, put them in water for 12 hours. That'll help dissolve some of the fibrous material around it. And then rinse it very thoroughly. You can actually um, you know, scrub them pretty well with your hands. And then save the largest, plumpest seeds. I separated it out in uh, some of the seeds here that were a little misshapen or shriveled. And I saved the big healthy looking seeds. Spread it out for a, in a single layer. I let these dry for several weeks. I tested for dryness by seeing if I, if I bent them, if they snapped and they were nice and dry. This is called a wet process and a long cure because of the need to let these plants dry after you have harvested them. When you dry wet seeds, it's a good idea just to let them sit in a strainer where you rinse them in for a little while. It gives you a kind of a head start on drying them. Let them sit on a towel for a few hours and then spread on a non-sticking surface. I like to use a silicone mat. I find that easier to use. It's easy to spread them around. They don't stick. Some people use a plastic uh, or glass or ceramic plate. I generally avoid a paper plate or a coffee filter because if there's any sticky residue on there, they may stick to the paper depending on what variety of seed you have. Some people do use a um, paper plate, but uh, I would recommend other material over that. Make sure you dry them in a airy, dry location where the humidity is low. 
near an AC is helpful because that generally is you know, that's a um, low humidity environment. And expect it to take a good three weeks or more. Again, make sure you test for dryness. A hammer test for larger seeds, using your fingernail to see if you can dent them. For some seeds, you can try bending them. If they crack, they're dry. But it's really, really important because if you don't test for dryness, you may end up with nothing but a moldy mess when you go to plant your seeds in the spring. So that's, you know, the number one enemy of seeds is uh, humidity and, and uh, wetness. And again, make sure you label your seeds at each step of the process. It's so easy to lose track of seeds that look similar. Let's talk about how you're going to store your seeds. The first step is putting them in seed packets. So you can use all sorts of devices here. Individual uh, envelopes you can buy. You can make things out of wax paper. I like to use Ziploc snack bags. I cut them in half and tape up one side and I get two bags out of one. I've used uh, little tea sample bags. I've made paper seed packets out of recycled paper, spice bottles. You can use vitamin bottles, medicine bottles, all sorts of things, but make sure you label them. I know I'm hammering home on that, but you really do want to make sure you put the variety name on there. I like to have things like the collection date. That's important. So you want to use your oldest seeds first. I like to put on here why I saved the seeds. Was there anything predictor I did to avoid uh, cross-pollination or anything I did to cross-pollinate? Any special characteristics? Why am I saving the seed? Did, was it particularly flavorful? Was it was it particularly sturdy? So that information is right at hand when I when it comes time to plant them. I like to make my own seed packets. I'll tell you honestly, I've really have fallen in love with using cone coffee filters because they are so easy. It's just fold, 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 and put a paper clip on them. I've also made some out of origami style fold only designs, and there are a zillion different templates you can search for on the web. I would advise looking for origami because that avoids the need for glue or tape. And sometimes glue and tape can attract critters that you don't want. And again, it gives you space to label them. And you, of course, will always label them. That leads us to the question of where are you going to store your packets? You want to make sure you protect them from all sorts of things, including my best little pal down here, Gus. Those delicata seeds that I so carefully saved, well, I didn't save them carefully enough because little Gus decided that he wanted to eat some pumpkin seeds. Um, actually, they were squash seeds, but to him, they tasted the same. Make sure you have a place where you can protect them from environmental conditions. And of course, the most important thing is to protect them from humidity. Uh, Moisture is the number one enemy of seeds. So you want to pack them somewhere that is going to protect them from any kind of moisture. You might even consider packing them with some silica desiccant packets. I recently bought a five pound bag of silica gel cat litter, and that will last me for the rest of my life and then some for protecting my seeds. Safeguard them from pest environments. Store them in zip top bags, screw top jars, locking plastic bins, and consider using a system that will help you facilitate planning. I put mine in individual locking plastic bins with labels on them for early fall planting, planting indoors in winter, early spring planting, summer planting, et cetera. And I keep mine in a little wicker basket with uh, a jar of labeling supplies. So everything is right there where I need it and I can just grab what I need. Now, the next question is, where do I store my basket? Well, keep in mind that again, moisture is an enemy. You want a place that is cool, dry, and dark. Coolness because it keeps your seeds from waking up. Dry, that outside covering of your seed is what protects it and keeps it from harm. It keeps it stored safely for a long time. It's its own little I don't know, safeguard. And dark keeps it uh, alive longer. So cool, dark, and dry. For me, 
the basement works well. You may have a cool closet or cupboard somewhere that works well. A better place would be an airtight container in your refrigerator. I don't have the space for that, so that's not an option for me. A best place would be in a five to 7% moisture content by weight stored several degrees below freezing. Now, not many people can pull that off. If you can, more power to you. But another thing to keep in mind that all seeds can benefit from being stored for a few days in your freezer. Why? Because that can help zap any pathogens that might be lurking unseen within your seeds. So stick them in the freezer for a few days, and zap whatever might be there that you don't know about, and then you can move them into a more permanent uh, home until you're ready to use them. Now, speaking of which, when you're ready to use them, bring them out and set them on the, your kitchen counter or wherever for several hours before you open them up because you don't want to have condensation form on the seeds prematurely. That can affect the longevity. And frankly, if you're planning on using the seeds over multiple seasons, like a, for cool season crops, like in the spring and then again in the fall, consider package them in, in multiple packets instead of all your seeds in one packet. So you might wanna have a, a spring version and a fall version of those seeds. Or if you're gonna use them over the course of several years, package them in different packets so they're not, you're not bringing them all out at one time because the seeds don't like to have been brought out in cool thaw, cool thaw, cool thaw cycles. So put them in several packets if you're going to use them over multiple years. They'll last longer that way. And speaking of lasting longer, let's talk about seed germination. Your seed germination rates will decline over time. And Catherine talked about the watermelon seeds. You know, those little watermelon seeds may have all germinated if they'd been planted the second, the first year. But after 200 years, you've got what, Catherine, 3% germination rate? Well, you can probably get better than that if you store them and process them properly. Do that carefully and you'll have some great success. Now let's look at what kind of success you can expect. This chart shows a variety of information, but I really want to focus on your seed longevity. Properly stored, properly processed, you can expect some good results from your seeds, and it varies by type of crop. For beans, you can expect you know, up to three years of good seed viability. Cucumbers, five to 10 years. Tomatoes, also five to 10 years. I was happy to see this. I came back from vacation a couple of weeks ago, and I saw a cherry tomato in the garden that was a volunteer. It didn't start until late, but I had these beautiful little cherry tomatoes that, unlike my other cherry tomatoes, had not cracked during this uh, recent period of rapid growth during the heavy rain we had while I was gone. And they beat sun gold in uh, my family's taste test. They were wonderful. So I was really happy to see that I could save these seeds and they'd be good for a good 10 years if I take care of them properly. So. There's a lot more information about seed viability in one of the handouts that we have, but this gives you an example of how long you can expect these seeds to last. So good news for some of these, they'll last you a good long time if you take care of them properly. And some final thoughts on these. Some of the easiest seeds to save are the tomatoes, beans, and lettuce. Cross-pollinating, you might wanna grow only one variety. Be careful because some of these, it's like um, cross-pollination among some crops is like the botanical version of unprotected sex. And some of this is, you don't wanna have sex with your nearest relatives because you get things that might come out strange. Pick your healthiest plants, your best crops. You might wanna have multiple plants. You know, things, some things like corn, you're not gonna get any pollinated corn if you don't have more than one corn stalk growing in your garden. Look for your favorable traits, the ones that you value, and harvest fully mature fruit, and in some cases, fruit that's more than mature. Learn what mature seeds look like. Don't make the mistake that I made with the cardinal flower. And learn to recognize plant diseases. Some of them can be transmitted by seed into the next generations, and 
gosh, this is so important. Make sure your seeds are really, really dry. You don't want to end up with this a pile of mold when you go to plant your seeds in the spring and then label, 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 label your seeds at every step. And on that note, let me see if there are any questions. Indeed there are. One of our uh, attendees is interested in a uh, ornamental native plant called wild senna. She's interested in saving seed from the dry pods. Is there anything unusual that has to be done? That I can't tell you. I believe wild senna is likely, um, I have one that I just planted in my garden this year. Catherine, you may know that. Yeah, uh, I do grow wild senna, and uh, there is absolutely nothing you really need to know that Libby didn't cover. It produces seed prolifically, and uh, they dry. I, you know, I get a lot of volunteers coming up because I, I already have as many plants as I need. But yeah, process, just use a typical dry process like for any seed pod. There's really nothing special required, and they're, they're wonderful, beautiful plants. Okay, thank you. Um, another question was how long you can keep seeds in the freezer? Well, regardless of where you keep them, any seed is going to deteriorate over time. Freezer is probably better than my basement. I, I honestly, it's going to vary depending on the particular species. I don't have a, I, I can't really answer that. I would say longer than in your basement, but probably not a whole lot longer than what you're seeing on the seed saving charts. Okay. Yeah. Great. Final question. What's the proper way to stratify seeds that require a cold period before planting? That's going to vary by the seed. Some seeds require a couple of weeks. Some require a couple of months. I know, for example, cardinal flower or flowers require a couple of months of cold stratification. And the degree of cold and the length of time is going to vary by species. So I think you need to just need to do your own research on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's not a single flat rule based on this general principles. It's going to be species specific. Okay. Well, thank you both for this really outstanding presentation. I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone did. And it was presented in such a comprehensive, but easily understandable uh, format. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you both. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye I would now. say good luck to all you sea savers out there. I hope you all have great success. Well, you're an inspiration. <laughs> Just make sure don't make my cardinal flower mistake. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.